So as I said before, I'm Leslie Johnson and my role outside of trying to manage this webinar series is the coordinator for the animal manure management team here in the state of Nebraska. And I'm going to talk to you today about a few of the things that we've changed in our or that our team has changed since the last five or six years for our annual trainings for livestock producers across the state. So in the state of Nebraska, livestock producers with a waste control facility are required to obtain manure education every five years. The University of Nebraska does provide this training. Uh, we do offer an online course that follows the same basic premises, but for today I'm just going to focus on our in-person training since we're talking about um, just the interactive portions. While there aren't hard regulations as to what needs to be covered during these trainings, our Department of the Environment and Energy provides our university with guidelines that outline the topics that we do have to address. I'm not gonna actually go through them, but you can see them here in this table. We do offer two different types of training, an initial training for those that have never taken any training before, and a recertification for those that have done it in the past. And so we often have producers that have been there more than one time before. The initial training does last about six and a half hours and the recertification training is a little over two hours long. So, and we often offer that, in it, that recertification training as a portion of the initial training. So during that portion of the day event, there's a combination of producers that have some experience, some that have lots of experience, and some that have very little or no experience at all. So I've been helping organize these events for approximately 11 years. Over those years, we've seen lots of changes, not so much to the rules or the topics addressed, but to the methods that we used to teach and the depth of each topic that we're covering. We've tried lots of different methods of teaching. We've tried different aspects of each topic. And we've gone from in-person trainings to pre-recorded videos. And then now we're back to more in-person trainings with multiple presenters in front of the, the uh, audience. Somewhere in the middle there, we even tried doing our recertification by webinar, and um, it didn't go incredibly well. Not that we won't try that again, but it's not something that we have pursued too much now. What we haven't done is stop trying new things. In the last five years, we've added a lot of interactive parts to our trainings. And the picture that I'm showing here shows our previous teaching methods. In the photo, I'm trying to introduce a topic before playing a video. You can see the audience is not super engaged. Some are sitting back with their arms crossed. Some are probably on their phones. What you don't see, even in those that are actually paying attention, is people who are actively involved in learning. By the end of two hours, or six for those that were taking the initial training, what we had was a whole lot of PowerPoint poisoning, as Dilbert has explained here. As a team, we knew we could do better. I knew I could make a better program, and the team was super supportive of trying some, my sometimes out-of-the-box out of ideas. So this is kind of what our programs look like now. Participants are actively involved in the learning process. They're making decisions about the example farms and they're asking questions that relate back to how the things work on their own farm. We do still have some PowerPoint presentations, don't get me wrong there, but much of what we're doing is active learning rather than passive learning as we've done in the past. And the audience, even those that don't want to be there, you know, the guy in the back that's going to sit there with his arms crossed because he has to be there but doesn't want to be, even those folks are seeing the value of at least a portion of the program. So Erica introduced you to the calibration kits a little bit. Uh, in 2016, as part of a small three-state North Central Region Water Network grant, I came up with this again, out of the box idea, so to speak. I actually did put it in a shoebox though, which is a little ironic. Uh, I designed scaled down shoebox kits with everything that the participants needed to calibrate the spreader on the box in a tiny form. Uh, the majority of our manure trainings take place in the winter time, so we don't have access to a space where an actual manure spreader calibration can take place. So I packed everything that would be needed into this shoebox. 
I did make kits for multiple calibration methods and both liquid and solid spreaders. In the upper left hand corner, what you're seeing is a solid spreader calibration where we actually have a scale to weigh the spreader. And we call this the axle weight method. Participants take the pseudo spreader that we have up here and, al and along with the loads of pseudo manure, which is a combination of sand and um, potting soil. <coughs> Erica uses chocolate sprinkles, whatever works is fine. And, um, and then we calculate whether if we apply that load of manure on the areas that I'm given here with these pa square paper, or rectangular papers, how much manure we actually applied. In the lower right corner over here is a sheet method of solid manure calibration, which is what Erica was talking more about. Again, I use sand and potting soil. She uses chocolate sprinkles. Whatever works is fine. Uh, but in that one, they discover, because we have multiple different sizes of sheets in there, they discover that the easiest way to determine application rate using the sheet method is to use a tarp or something that is about 22 square feet. Uh, that makes for simple calculations going between pounds per square foot and tons per acre. There isn't any, which is really handy. The shoe, shoe box kits, as I said, were developed in the summer of 2016. Our trainings are in the winter, so we implemented them for land application training in 2017. This shows you a peak of what our evaluations have looked like for the last several years. We ask folks at the end of the program to score us on each topic with zero being what they, that they learned absolutely nothing and four being that they gained a ton of knowledge. I would note that this particular activity was the first of its kind and was totally a step outside of the norm for most of the educators. And I know at least one of them is on today, so we can ask him to share. Um, the educators at this point were very used to playing videos. And so when I instructed them to give a bit of an introduction and then just let folks stumble through the process to learn, they struggled themselves. I had more than one of them tell me that they really didn't like this project initially because they felt like they had lost complete control of their classroom uh, because they weren't the ones doing the teaching up front. I'm pretty certain that their hesitation is the reason for the lower scores in 2017 um, because after that they did improve. This year we didn't have a lot of time because we had to add in other activities. And so the calibration activity was cut short and was more of a discussion. We still didn't use PowerPoint, but scores are maybe a little bit lower because of that. Uh, last year in 2019, after I attended a Iowa State training with Dan Anderson and I asked permission of course, but I stole his idea and copied it to make a worksheet that identified where setbacks and where stockpiles should be for a particular field. We didn't do any kind of a presentation and we told participants that there definitely wasn't a correct answer here. We just wanted to hear from them why they were placing piles where they were and give them some guidance for things to look for, that kind of thing. We did provide a little bit of guidance in the form of the infographic that you see here on the right. <coughs> Excuse me. We had it printed on cardstock and is about a little bit bigger than an index card with the intention that they could take it with them and keep it handy in the tractor after the pr program was over and to take that as a, as a reminder. We asked them what areas we needed to avoid and where you're going to place that stockpile. Once the audience had determined where they were going to place that pile, the worksheet then threw a wrench in the plan and asked them, okay, you've determined where you're going to put it. Now, how are you going to get it there? You're going to move it from this turkey operation over here to your field that's over here represented by the corn. What way are you going to go? Uh, we did tell them again that there was no correct answer and the, the educators that were helping teach this really appreciated it. There was a cheat sheet that we gave them that had more information than what was provided on the worksheet. Things like school bus routes, bridges that needed to be avoided, roads that are narrow, that kind of thing were all things that the, that the instructors had that information, but the audience would have had to ask because they wouldn't have known that from the just looking at the map. 
participants did seem to like this activity. Uh, we did encourage them to work with partners, so they discussed options with their neighbors. And again, scores were drastically improved after adding the activity. You can see in 2019 here, our scores are mostly fours, which is very, very good. Thank you, and we appreciated that. I did mention previously, we have not changed all of our presentations to be hands-on. Because we have a lot of topics to get through, we have a lot of cover things that we have to cover in a very limited amount of time. We know it's not feasible to cover everything and be interactive with all of it. We learned the hard way, especially with one of the new activities this year, that teaching using this interactive method does take quite a bit more time to teach. We do try to incorporate some kind of small interactive portion into each of the presentations, but that's not always possible either. Uh, one example is for soil and manure sampling. We have one slide in the middle where we compare the two and talk about things that are, are similar. The fact that you need to do subsamples for both of those things uh, is something that we can point out that way with just a comparison slide. During the nutrient content presentation, we always have included a math problem that has them calculating the availability of nitrogen from the manure, which is important, especially um, here in Nebraska. For the p-index presentation, we've gone away from doing a full demonstration of the product or of the program, and instead we have pre-filled examples where the audience, or sorry, the educator can alter just a few components of the program and see how that affects it. Um, we found that a lot of our producers attend our trainings are actually hiring consultants that are doing the P-Index Forum. So we felt it was less important that they know how to run the tool as to what actually makes the changes. So that's a portion where we've decided to cut some of the program back there and focus on teaching the impacts rather than how to do it so that they can make better decisions on the front and be able to guide their, their consultants. So just grabbing one example of our presentations where we haven't really made a lot of changes, you can see even without those changes that our scores are higher in the later years. We attribute this fact to the, the fact that people are more satisfied with the program in general. Uh, therefore, they're rating us higher across the board even on the presentations that we haven't made a ton of changes to. So this is one of the newer activities that we have. We just did it this year. Uh, previously, our record keeping presentation hadn't been changed, but this year we added a scavenger hunt where the, we had the participants look through our record keeping calendar that we offer to livestock producers as a way to keep track of all of their manure records. Um, so what they were instructed to do is to look at this checklist, find where that record could be found in the calendar, and then write it down on that checklist. So. We designed the checklist so that that's something that they can take home and use on their own farm. Even if they're not using the calendar, it can be kind of a point of reference for them so that if their water line records, if this is a feedlot, if their water line rainfall records are kept in the feed truck as they're um, driving through the feedlot, they can keep that there. If some of the other inspections are kept by somebody in the office, then they can mark down that it's in so-and-so's office and maybe which drawer it's in, that kind of thing. So this is a tool that they can take home with them too after the fact. Uh, we learned very early in this year's events that we didn't schedule nearly enough time for that scavenger hunt. Uh, like I said before, the interactive programming is definitely a lot more time consuming to teach, but you do get a better impact. I, at least we feel like we get a better impact. Um, so we didn't schedule nearly enough time for this, so I think that's probably why our scores aren't as good as what I expected them to be this year. Uh, we'll see how it comes in the next few years as we continue to adapt and, and develop this. But you can see by this one too that again our scores are still higher even after we've added some of the other interactive things in the past few years. Uh, so the other new activity that we had this year was a really big one. This year, our Nebraska manure team, along with Chrissy Smotterman at the University of Minnesota, worked to produce a new game to pull several aspects of manure management together into one big cohesive decision-making activity. 
On this map, we placed four fields that had and corresponding practices for those fields and the analyses for those fields and, and an AFO card with information about the facility and their manure analysis all on this, on this map. Participants then worked through six activities, including getting to know the operation, valuing the nutrient content of the manure for a particular field, transportation costs, water quality risks, soil health benefits, as well as neighbor nuisances. This took a long time. Uh, each section had a worksheet to keep track of the benefits and barriers to using the manure on each field. And once those barriers and benefits had been recognized, participants decided whether or not they were going to place a happy or a sad emoji on their field related to that particular activity. And the activities then built upon each other. The participants were allowed to make choices that could relate back to their own operations. Uh, for example, we didn't tell them whether or not the fields had grass waterways, which of course would decrease erosion and potentially improve water quality. They could have looked at the pictures and tried to guess. But while I was teaching and when they asked me, of course, I told them to do what they would have done on their own farms. If they tore out all of their grass waterways in order to increase the plantable acres that they had on their farm, then that's how they should do this farm and so that they could relate it back to them their own operation. Uh, if they stretch their planter right next to that uh, wetland, then that's what they should be doing here or, or taking that into consideration here. Uh, so that allowed for some differences each time they went through the activity and it made it really relatable back to their own operation. I did say this did take a long time. The activity took between an hour and a half, two hours depending on how many questions we had and how familiar folks were with the topics that we covered. Even though that seems like a really, really long time for just one activity, we were graced with wonderful comments from our audience. Things they, they said things like, wow, that was the fastest training I've ever attended. And um, I can't believe we're almost done already. And so people really did enjoy this activity. They were in, involved in it and they didn't realize that they had spent an hour and a half to two hours all on one big project. It went really fast for everybody, including the instructors. <laughs> Uh, at the end of our programs, I have recently added in the last several years a question on our evaluations. We didn't get a lot of written feedback before, um, and, but we really wanted to know what is working and what really isn't working for these producers. What do they want to see from us? So rather than asking for comments and suggestions, we asked them to tell us what was the best part of this workshop. Um, I'm showing here just this year's results and you can see that the activities being hands-on and interactive as well as working in a group were the things that were most pointed out. I would note here that we do still have a comment suggestions for changes section and most people will fill out that favorite part question. Some we'll fill out the comments and suggestions after that but we had almost none that will f would fill out the comments and suggestions previously. So by adding a question that they do know the answer to, it helps them to think about better what might change for the future too. It opens that line of communication. <clears throat> so what's next for our team? We're continuing to use the map game in other events. Uh, in fact, next week, now that we have this crazy virus, we're actually going to try and use it in an online form for a bunch of extension educators and industry professionals here in Nebraska. We'll see how that goes, but um, we are also hoping to use it for some new audiences maybe in the future, and we expect that we'll add, um, add some new activities, maybe expand on the ones that we currently have. And of course, we'll continue to switch out presentations for other activities, maybe go back to some presentations for other topics to accommodate some of the activities. What I don't expect to see is our team to settle in on one activity and stick with it forever. Um, and, and we'll just keep changing it up and see what happens.